Okay, welcome. This will be dry run number one. Uh, we're going to be talking about using pre-built AI to solve business problems. My name is Jason Hand. I'm a cloud advocate for Microsoft. Um, so let's get started. So in today's talk, there's going to be lots of information. There's going to be links. Um, there's a whole back-end system that you can use that I'll be using as well. All of that's available to you if you want to get, get a picture now. Uh, I'll also providing, I'll, I'll be providing this slide at the end. So if you don't get it now, we can make sure you capture this later on. But let's move forward here. So we'll be using pre-built AI services uh, essentially to add human-like capabilities to our applications. But what does that mean exactly? Well, uh, I'll go through a few examples in, in just a moment, but essentially we're trying to, we're, we're gonna be talking to the, these main three things here, sp vision, speech, and understanding. Now, you could give your app the power of speech. Um, let's say uh, you're adding some sort of chat uh, interface. Uh, you're doing like a chat bot or something like that. Uh, you could also, you could give your app the ability to see and understand the content of images. And so it can look through images and kind of parse through it and understand what it's looking at. Uh, you could give your app the intuition to understand what your users are most likely to want, do to, um, uh, want to do, and then optimize your user interface automatically based on their own behaviors and just the things that they're uh, kind of doing to interface with your system. You could automate the human process of scanning streams of data for anomalies and react uh, to that stuff accordingly. Um, and then, I'm sorry, and that's, that's our last thing there. Um, yeah, and so, and these are just a few examples of this, of the types of things that you could do with, by trying to add human-like capabilities uh, through AI. And a lot of that can be done with just basic services that are already ready for you out of the box. Now, we've talked a lot about uh, how AI techniques can help, but that it doesn't really take a lot of data. Uh, but doesn't it take a lot of data, I guess is probably what you're asking yourself, and a lot, or a lot of technical expertise just to implement this type of thing? Well, the answer is, is the short answer is no. You can draw on the expertise of uh, Microsoft Research, which has used its extensive data repositories and, and AI experts to create off-the-shelf AI services in Azure for you to use via just simple REST API calls. And that's called Azure Cognitive Services. So we're going to look at a lot of that today. Azure Cognitive Services includes more than uh, two dozen APIs but at the broadest level, they offer capabilities with these categories of human capability. So I've kind of these narrowed them down into these just five things. And those are vision, uh, which is understanding the content of photographs, drawings, text, handwriting, and even video. Uh, speech is the next one, which tools to understand and recognize speech and generate uh, natural human-like spoken voice. So these are the types of things that we talked about with chatbots or just um, automatic assist these chat assistants, the things that kind of interact with people. Then there's language, which we you know understand the content of written documents and text and translate that between different human languages. So it kind of works well with the speech uh, as well. And then decision, this is an entirely new category for Azure Cognitive Services, which is all about making human-like choices about the data or the content and then the applications that the user uh, is interfacing with. So it kind of uses some different uh, things together to make those decisions for you. And then the last one is search, which we're, is where we'll answer natural language questions about the content of large unstructured repositories. And if you checked out AI ML 10, you probably saw some demonstrations about that. And that search category, like I just mentioned, was covered in the previous talk in this learning path. But in this talk, we're going to touch on just a few of the other available services and use them to enhance the website of a retailer. Uh, we're going to be going over computer vision, which we'll use to analyze the content of a product photograph. And then we're going to go over, uh, we can talk about custom vision, which we'll use to identify the specific products that our retailer uh, actually has for sale. And then last, we'll do uh, a demo with the personalizer, which automatically adapts the layout of your website uh, by s really just observing customer preferences and, and the present uh, and present the best product categories first, even for anonymous users. So we can kind of look at the behavior of people uh, across not only the specific user behavior, if, if they're logged in and we have that type of information, but also more importantly, just anonymous behavior, but using context of other things to make some decisions. 
Um, <clears throat> so the principles of setting up and using cognitive services are the same for all the APIs. So what you learn here today applies to uh, really any of the AI, AI services that you want to use. So we're only going to be talking about computer vision because custom vision and personalizer, but the things I show you is really, you can use it in all this type of stuff. So hopefully you go and try some things out. So first let's look at a pre-built AI computer vision and how we can get, how we can give an application the ability to see and then customize it to our particular needs. So this is the website for Tailwind Traders. It's a hardware retailer. You may have already heard about it in some of the other talks. The Tailwind Traders website has many of the usual e-commerce features, the ability to browse the product category, uh, catalog, order products online, and uh, find products in retail stores. But it has a few AI-enabled features as well, uh, as, and we'll show those in just a moment. So as you might have guessed, Tailwind Traders, it's a fictitious company, uh, but that means I can give you all the source code to deploy this app yourself, and you can go play around with it and you know see if it's something that you can apply to your own situation. And you can find the link to go get all of that there at the bottom, that AKS link. So let's go to the Tailwind Traders website. And one of the AI-enabled features that we want to talk about is this shop by photo feature. And this feature that it allows the customer to upload a photo of a product that they might want to purchase. And the idea is that the app will then tell them if the product is available. So let's go ahead and try that out here. I'm going to go in and I've just uh, uh, selected the drill and it's brought in, you know, what it th thought is what I'm trying to search for. So the, it recognizes the drill and it shows me the drill in Tailwind Traders. And, and so that's exactly what we want. But let's say we try a different picture. Let me return to the home page. And now we're going to use this feature again, this time choosing a picture of a pair of pliers. Now, unfortunately, when the app analyzes this picture here, it thinks it's a hammer, which obviously we, we know, you know, it's not a hammer. And so we can see that it's wrong and we need to do something to fix our computer vision. So that's what we're, we're going to kind of step into next. But before we do that, it's going to be helpful to dive into a little bit of the theory to understand how computer vision works. And don't worry, this isn't gonna be uh, you know, very much math. Uh, and understanding a bit about computer vision works, uh, how it works will really help us understand what can go wrong and how you can fix it. So I promise it's not gonna be anything too difficult, not gonna be over your head. Um, um, so but let's dive in here. So now I'm gonna give you just a second to read this here. And I hope many of you are familiar with the XKCD comics. Um, they're so good and, and for, for reasons like this, but not long ago, being able to give a computer a photograph and being able to give us useful information about what's in the picture was literally the, literally the stuff of science fiction. And then, you know, this XKCD uh, was published here in September, 2014. Uh, now just, you know, four or five years later, five and a half years later, a computer can easily tell whether a photo is of a bird, thanks to the advent of big data, GPU computing, and uh, convolutional neural networks. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So let's see how that's done. This explanation is adapted with permission from Brandon Rohrer, who maintains an excellent blog and video tutorial series with an in-depth explanation of many aspects of AI and uh, machine learning. So you should go check that out. Uh, check out his blog for more details if you have time. Uh, but I only have time to really sketch things out at a high level here. So um, you've probably heard that AI is powered by something called deep learning. Now the deep in deep learning doesn't mean profound. It simply means that the image passes through a neural network with many layers when it's being analyzed. And that's it. Now on the screen is a very simple neural network. This one only has five layers. It's real world vision systems uh, have many, whereas real world vision systems have many dozens of layers, perhaps hundreds. Okay, so this is just a very simple one with just five layers. And this one is designed to take an image as input and then classify that image as one of exactly four objects, There's just four, dog, bicycle, apple, and tennis ball. <clears throat> and that's it. it. It's not capable of, de of detecting anything or any other kind of object except for those four things that it's been trained to recognize. Now, when a neural network has been trained, it passes the input image through the network layer through the network layer by layer at each layer, transforming the image into something different, like some like smaller images. 
And each layer recombines the images generated in the prior layer. And the images get smaller and smaller until at the very end, they're just a single pixel with a value between zero and one. And that value represents the confidence the neural network has that the image represents the given object. The higher the number, the more confident it is. And in this case, we've inputted an image of a bicycle and the bicycle node. At the right side is the one with the highest value. So it looks like the neural network has been well-trained to detect bicycles, or at least this one has. But how do you train a neural network? And how is it that the image being transformed How's that being transformed along the way? At each node of the network, or each circle that you see here, a filter is applied to the image. And it's much the same idea as a Snapchat filter or an Instagram filter or any other filter from video and, and image apps. But instead of doing something useful like making the image uh, sepia toned or adding bunny ears to your faces or making you look 10 years younger, it's doing something different. And that was decided uh, in the training process. That, so it was some, doing something that was already decided long, you know, well before. And let's, so let's dive in to see if we can see what that looks like. So how do we train a neural network to do that? And how do we, you know, choosing the right filters? Well, each click or <laughs> each node or circle you see here, uh, in the neural network is a transformation of its input images, which is determined by a grid of weights. Now this, the trick to, to training a neural network is to choose those weights in such a way that the right numbers come out at the end. We'll do that with training data, lots of images of dogs and bicycles and apples and tennis balls. We know what each image represents because a human has looked at them and labeled them or annotated them. And so as long, so all we do is just pick weights in such a way that we, that we, that the correct node gets the largest value in each case, or at least as often as possible. But in real vision networks, there may be millions of weights to choose and millions of labeled images to compute against. So how will we determine the weights? This is the point where most of the books on machine learning begin to dive into the math and start talking about things like backpropagation and learning rate and cost function. But unless you're an AI researcher, you can pretty much ignore all of that for two reasons. First, there are lots of great tools available that will do all the math for you while taking advantage of powerful computing resources like big data stores and GPU processors. You've probably heard of tools like TensorFlow or PyTorch. The, those are tools that do this type of thing. And you'll hear more about them in late, later on in some of the other talks in this learning path. And then secondly, even though to make use of those tools, you'll need, a, let's say, lots of training data, those powerful computing resources and a team of AI engineers to make use of, of all of it. So instead, you can just use the resources of a project or a company that has already used lots of data and computing and expertise to train a neural network and use that through just an API. So saves you a ton of time and research because a lot of it's already been done for you from other people. So you can use a model with uh, predetermined weights and as long as you only need to detect the object classifications the model is actually trained for, you're all set to go. You just provide your image and you use the classifications that the pre-trained model will generate for you. Some models do more than just classify too. They can also detect the location of objects within images or analyze the image in other ways. Now let's try a pre-trained AI model, cognitive service computer vision. This service will analyze an image you provide and provides tags or classifications for the objects it detects as well. These are just the labels associated with the top confidence scores at the right of the convolutional network from before. But now you're using a powerful neural network from Microsoft capable of identifying many thousands of objects. And there's a real simple web-based UI you can use to try it all out. Um, where it's at, if you go to aka.ms aka try dash computer vision. So I'm gonna go over it and we're gonna try that out now. And then in a moment, I'll also show you how to access the API programmatically. Um, and see how that's done as well. All right, so this is Cognitive Services Computer Vision page. And if you scroll down a little bit on this page, you'll find a nice web-based form that allows us to upload an image for analysis, either from the web or as a local file. So let's try uploading this picture of a man in a hard hat. 
Now, in just a few seconds, we'll get back the analysis of, of that picture by the computer vision service. Okay, so on the left, it shows us the object it detected in the image, and on the right, we have this JSON output, this JSON representation with the detailed analysis. And that includes the names and the locations of the objects detected in the image, a list of tags or labels associated with the image, a plain language description of the image, in, in this case, a man wearing a hard hat, um, or wearing a helmet, and then lots of other useful information, even all the way down to accent color. So we can see here in the objects section of the output that the two objects have been detected in the image, some, head, uh, some headwear and, and a person. Okay, so we've got a person showing up in there. You can see headwear showing up in there. Uh, but we're more interested in the tag section if we look down in there, uh, which provides classifications for the overall image along with uh, not just classifications, but also a confidence score. And in this case, the classification with the highest confidence after man is headdress, which isn't exactly what we need for our shop to photo app to work correctly. We were looking for a hard hat because that's what something likely, much more likely that someone will put in for the search. Now, unfortunately, this API isn't trained to detect hard hats, only helmets. And that's only the sixth most, con most confident classification we see here anyway. So we'll need to learn how to fix this, uh, and I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. But if you want to incorporate vision capabilities into an app, rather than using a web form, you'll, you'll want to ac access the computer vision API programmatically. So let's see how we can do that. <clears throat> you can interface to, uh, you can interface to the Cognitive Service API using any language that can connect to an HTTP endpoint. But what I have here is a Bash script that uses the Azure CLI to create resources and connects to the Computer Vision API using curl. So we'll go through this here and I'll step you through exactly what's happening. I'm going to um, go ahead and um, using Azure CLI, get connected here, and one by one, I'll, run, I'll step through each of these commands. The first command that we've got here is going to create a resource group, which we'll use to hold the keys and, that I'll need to use to authenticate uh, to our API. The next step is to create the keys. Here I'm creating an omnibus cognitive services key which uh, I can use with many different services, including computer vision. Then we can display the keys. Now with that key, we can connect to the endpoint URL provided by the computer vision service. So let's save the URL in an environment variable as well. And then we can choose an image to analyze. And here we, we provide the URL of an image, the same image, image of a man in a hard hat that we were looking at previously. There you can see, see it's a, what the image looks like. And now we can pass the key in the image URL into the endpoint um, using JSON, uh, passing in a JSON input using curl. And in just a few milliseconds, we'll get back the analysis of the image um, as JSON. You can see the same output we saw. It's, uh, it was in the web interface, but now here it's in our terminal. And we can do that with any image we like, of course. And let's try that again with a different image. In this case, uh, the picture of a drill. So let's go back and grab that. Here's my drill. Set that as our variable. Just show you what this looks like. This is our image that we're going to be passing this in. Copy our curl command, run that. And we see we get back JSON telling us what it knows about this. Now, once again, uh, this all worked great. And, but interestingly, if you, topped, if you look, the top tag associated with the image is camera, which sadly isn't really what we're looking for here. And that's not totally true. So we need to do um, you know, something because we, we would want drill to be the top tag there. 
So now you can see why the computer vision API might not be the best choice for the shot by fo shot by photo feature at Tailwind Traders. In some cases, the vision model um, it's using isn't trained to identify the specific products that Tailwind Traders sells. Uh, and then in other cases, it's just been trained to detect too many different kinds of things. And so it ends up being wrong uh, uh, because uh, there's just so many objects the wrong one is the thing that's being found. And as you just saw, given a picture of a drill, it gives us back the tag of a camera. And a product like a camera isn't something that Tailwind Traders is selling. But fortunately, we can fix that problem. So let's dive back into the theory, uh, but uh, theory for a moment. Uh, what if I told you that there's a way to start with a vision model that's been pre-trained to identify many thousands of images? and adapt it to identify just the objects you're interested in, um, even if those objects weren't part of the training data for the original model. Sounds kind of strange, I know, but let's see how it might work. Here we have <clears throat> the trained convolutional neural network from before, but something's a little different. The final layer with the object classification has been stripped off. So if you remember there was the, was it a Tennis ball, dog, all those things. All that's gone. What we're left with is just the images from the second second to last layer. We can we can ignore the fact that they they are even images, say th three by three images, and just think of them as data. Now, when we feed an image to the left hand side instead of getting confidence scores, we get a collection of arrays or what are called features, each with nine data points and. And this is sort of a toy network, right? They're only labeled F1, 2, up to 8. And each image you put in on the left side generates a different collection of features on the right side. And we don't really know what those features are, but we do know uh, is that they are useful because they were, they were useful to classify all the images types from the neural network that was originally trained for in the first place. So who knows? One of the features might be uh, might represent greenness and was useful to help us classify trees as well as tennis balls. Another might count the number of circles, uh, circle-shaped regions in the image and was useful in classifying, let's say, bicycles or traffic lights. The point is those features weren't defined in advance. They were learned from the training data and are useful for classifying images really just in general. But here's the trick. We can use those features to classify objects that the original network wasn't even trained on. So let's suppose we want a new model to identify hammers and hard hats. We can pass an image of a hammer on the left hand uh, or on the left and collect the features on the right. In this case, we get eight data vectors, one for each feature and a binary indicator of the object type right? One or a zero. And we can repeat that for several different pictures of a hammer and collect the data vectors and the binary indicator each time. Now let's do the same thing but with a picture of a hard hat. Again, in, in each case, we collect eight data vectors and a binary indicator for each one. It's either a zero or a one. Is it a hammer or a hard hat? You put it all together and what do you have? You have a collection of data vectors, each with an associated binary outcome. And if you've done any data science, you can guess what happens next. We could build a simple predictive model, like a logistic regression or a one layer neural network to predict the new object class classifications from those features that we just, we just um, landed on as our outcomes. <clears throat> and it turns out this often works surprisingly well. You don't even need a lot of data. <clears throat> a few dozen images will often do the trick. So as long as the categories you want to predict are fairly distinct, you're good. And you don't need a lot of computing power, power to predict 100 or so binary outcomes from a relatively small amount of data. Of course, this is, again, just kind of a toy example, but you would likely want to identify more than two objects if you're trying to do this in real life. And the underlying neural network will certainly generate many more than just eight features as its second to last layer. So keep that in mind. But the principle still remains, and you can do this with modest new data and compute powder, power, and it often works really well just you know, in, in, with very little effort. 
Now, of course, you don't have to train uh, a transfer learning model by yourself. You can use the advanced vision models from cognitive services computer vision as the base and provide your own images and classifications to the service called custom vision. Custom vision. Uh, just like with computer vision, you can train transfer learning models programmatically using the API, but custom vision also provides a convenient web UI for training models as well. Uh, let's use that now and train a model for our shop by photo feature that we uh, were showing off in Tailwind Traders. So here I am in the custom vision uh, web-based interface and it provides us with this nice little UI where we can provide new images or uh, for the transfer learning analysis. And as you can see in this project, uh, I've already uploaded a number of pictures. I've uploaded you know, some screwdrivers, some pliers, some drills, some hammers, which I'm gonna use to train my custom model. Now, we'd all also like to detect one other thing from Tailwind Traders that they sell, and that's hard hats. So let's go ahead and go into our images here and browser folder and uh, on my hard drive, and I'm gonna go in and grab a hard hat, an image of a hard hat. And actually, I'm gonna get all these hard hats. <clears throat> and we're gonna upload those into, into our little analysis here. It'll take a few months to upload those files, but while it's doing that, notice that there aren't that many, uh, you know, maybe 180 or so, so a few dozen, dozen of each of these, uh, of the five categories, and sometimes even less. <clears throat> Now, despite that, because my five object types are fairly distinct, uh, the model should work fairly well. So let's go ahead and click uh, the train button, which we've done there, uh, we'll do here in a moment. <clears throat> okay, so we've got these five groups here. Now I'm gonna go click up here in the train and it's gonna start the transfer learning and we'll choose quick training. Um, now it's running in all those images through a complex vision model. Uh, and using transfer learning to create this predictive model for our five categories. And it only takes a few seconds and our models, you know, like I said, they do work pretty well. Now the probability threshold sets a limit below uh, which we will predict no classifications at all. And if we only accept classifications with 50% confidence or more, 90.9% .9 of those predictions are correct. That's precision. And the model correctly classifies 88.2% of our images overall. That's recall. And in your apps, you'll choose a threshold according to your tolerance for making the wrong call versus making no call at all. Uh, for Tailwind Traders, we can set the threshold you know, kind of on the low side because it's not that big of a deal to suggest the wrong product to a customer. Had we been uh, detecting cancer, we might have made a different call on that. Now let's try our model on some new images <clears throat> that it hasn't seen before. What we do is uh, we'll go in here and upload some images. All right. We'll go, <clears throat> so we, we got this uh, hard hat here and it's showing us a probability of 99 point. So we'd make the call, you know, it's pretty good here in terms of what our new model was able to test. So let's try a different image. Let's do a drill this time. Our model identifies the drill as 94.5%, which is also pretty good. And if we go in and we do one more, if we check on our pliers, we'll see it's getting 99.9%, .9%, even better. So our model works well, even though it's been trained on less than 200 images. And that's because we've constrained the potential labels to only those products that we sell at Tailwind Traders, just those five. So now that we're pretty happy with our model, we can export it and incorporate it into our app. Uh, and you can do that you know, in just a few clicks. Uh, you can export it out here as lots of different things. It's CoreML, TensorFlow, uh, Docker. Uh, we're gonna go with the Onyx file. So now that we're happy with our model, we're gonna export that out to our local hard drive. Okay, so we exported our file out here, our custom model in the uh, Onyx format or ONNX or the Open Neural Network Exchange. Uh, that's the open standard launched um, by both Microsoft and Facebook to promote the free exchange and development and deployment of AI models. And uh, it's supported by a wide range of applications and technology vendors. 
Now that we've trained our custom vision model, let's integrate it into the Tailwind Traders app. For that, we're going to use the Onyx Runtime, which is an open source interface. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, or, I'm sorry, in inference engine that provides functions to generate predictions from models in the Onyx format. <coughs> Okay, now that we've created our custom model, we can call uh, in an app using its the API that, we've, that, we, that we have for it. And here we create a new inference session from the Onyx file we generated. And then <clears throat> we'll generate a classification label from the uploaded images as a string. Then we just pass uh, that into the existing search feature of the Tailwind Traders website and just display the results from there. So the model that we just exported from the custom vision is actually uh, just a zip file containing the actual Onyx file. There's a model.onyx file, uh, which is just a text representation of the neural network we just created, <clears throat> as well as a, as a manifest file. And the existing Tailwind Traders website already uses a computer vision model represented as an Onyx file. Um, it's just labeled product.onyx. Uh, the problem is that that model doesn't properly recognize any of the products we sell as, as Tailwind Traders. So we'll take the model Onyx file we just exported from our custom vision, rename it as products.onyx, uh, and replace it in our web app so that the shot by photo can recognize all five products we trained it on. And here in the Azure portal, we can see that the app service resource, which uh, runs the Tailwind Traders website, what I can do now with the app service um, is just go down to the development tools and go into the, with the tool that's called Kudu. Now that that's launched, I can then browse through the website file system. Uh, we'll go into the debug console. And we'll browse to the site through www root standalone Onyx models. Here we will find our products dot onyx. Now returning to the app service, we can go ahead and, and restart the web server, which will make um, once we've drug dragging this over, replace that. Now we're going to pop back over, and uh, we need to restart our app service. We're restarting the app service. And we'll move forward. Okay, now while we're waiting for the website to restart, let's take a look inside that Onyx file, inside the model that we just installed. There's a really nice little web app uh, by Let's Rotor called Netron, which allows us to inspect the neural networks in an Onyx file. So let's go ahead and open the product's Onyx file here uh, so we can see what that looks like. All right, <clears throat> so here we can actually see the, the actual layers of the neural network represented by the model. And let's zoom in a little bit and take a look at the input at the top. The input is an image, and it's a three-layer RGB image of size 224 by 224 pixels. I actually had to crop and scale down the image provided by the user before providing it to the Onyx runtime. It's a bit of a dirty secret that computer vision systems have rather poor vision. Uh, they work with quite low image resolutions, but nonetheless, they still work quite well. Now let's zoom out and scroll through the network and you can see all of the layers in the neural network created by the custom vision, which uh, each layer, you know, transforming the input image, applying different filters and recombining the, Im the output image, just as you learned earlier in, you know, in this talk. Uh, so, but when you get down to the output layer at the very end, you can see the output is a list of five values. The five products we trained in it on, uh, trained it on were hammer, hard hat, and so on. Now, along with that, we have the value labeled loss, which is the confidence of the model per, uh, that the model predicts for each category in your app. And you'll choose your own threshold for how high the confidence needs to be. Anyway, now that the Tailwind Traders uh, website is restarted, let's go back to the homepage and see how our new vision model works. Let's go ahead and we're going to upload a new photo and try once again one of our test images, specifically our image of the pliers that didn't work well before.
And we can see, <coughs> indeed, it did find uh, our players and show me all the products that we offer. Okay, we've got time for just one more quick example of a pre-built AI, uh, this time from the decision category of the cognitive services. Uh, it's called the Personalizer. And the Personalizer, Personalizer service allows us to customize the interface of apps in real time, balancing on what the user is most likely to wanna see, coupled with the things that we would like them to see or like them to be doing. And we can see how this might work with the recommended section of Tailwind Trader's website. It shows a selection of the departments available in the store. <clears throat> One is over here in this large hero image on the left, showing power tools, coupled with uh, a view, uh, coupled with a few smaller images over on the right, plumbing, electrical, and garden center. And a personalizer service will choose for us how those sections appear according to an AI technique called reinforcement learning. Personalizer has been in development at Microsoft for many years, actually. It's used on Xbox devices to, de to determine what activities are featured on the homepage, uh, like playing <clears throat> an installed game or purchasing a new game from the store or watching others play on Mixer. Um, since the introduction of Personalizer, the Xbox team has actually seen a t you know, huge lift, a significant lift in key engagement metrics that they're you know, watching in terms of what people are doing on Xbox. Personalizer is also used to optimize the placement of ads and Bing searches and the articles featured in uh, MSN News. And again, with pretty good results, you know, improving engagement from users. Now, uh, all that same stuff is available to you in Personalizer and you can put it into your own apps as well. Personalizer implements the, an AI technique called reinforcement learning. And here's how it works. Suppose we want to display a hero action to the user. The user might not be sure exactly what they want to do next, but we could display one of a, one of several different suggestions for a gaming app, or maybe we want to play the game, maybe we want to get them to watch a movie or join in a clan. Uh, based on that user's history and other contextual information, say their location, the time of day, uh, maybe the day of the week, the personalizer service will then rank the possible actions and suggest the best one uh, for them to promote. Now, hopefully the user will be happy, but how can we be sure? Well, that depends on what the user does next and whether that has something, in, whether that was something that we wanted them to do. Now, according to our business logic, we'll assign a reward score between zero and one to what happens next. For example, spending more time playing a game or reading an article or spending money in the store might lead to a higher uh, reward score. Personalizer then feeds that info back into the ranking system for the next time when we need to feature an activity. But this isn't just a recommendation system, which has you know, the danger of presenting users with things that they, they know they already like or they've already bought. What about the things that, uh, you know, the, the things that they would like? That's the type of stuff that we want them to be providing, you know, not just things that they, we already know. So Personalizer is usually in what's called the exploit mode, where it recommends the best activity based on history and context, but sometimes it also enters uh, what's called explore mode. And this presents the user with new things that they may not otherwise see. It's kind of like an automated A-B testing, but with more than just two branches, all tested in real time. And you can control what percentage of the time explore mode is activated um, to help the user discover new contents or features. In our Tailwind Traders app, for anonymous users, we're gonna use the time of day, day of week, and browser OS as context to influence our rankings. For the reward score, what we'll use is, uh, that'll help, <clears throat> we will then use whether or not, <coughs> excuse me, for the reward score, we will use whether or not the hero section was clicked. Now, in this code, we provide a reward score of one if the featured category was clicked and zero otherwise. So over time, Personalizer will determine the best category to feature for anonymous users based on time of day, day of week, and OS, and will also explore 20% of the time uh, and it will also do this explore thing 20% of the time, which means it's going to surface categories that would have otherwise not been presented. <clears throat> okay, so let's see the personalizer in action. If we go back into Tailwind Trader's homepage, what I didn't mention before is that this is a recommended section, okay? In, in the ordering of the product department, it's is determined by the personalizer. 
In this case, it's presenting the electrical department as the hero image. And we can also see it's got some other, you know, explore behavior. And if we refresh the website a few times, okay, now apparently it feels that the garden center is um, best engagement for my for the anonymous users in this type of day. But we can go the, through this a number of times, and you'll eventually see um, that it's going to start suggesting other categories. And here we'll see in a moment. Maybe one more. There we go. We can see that plumbing has popped up, and the personalizer will use that to measure engagement as well. If I were to click on that, um, that's going to be another data point that they'll use to make future decisions. So that's how the personalizer, personalizer works. So we've seen a few ways that we can use pre-built AI to enhance our applications with human-like capabilities. So let's wrap, wrap up with a few things you should keep in mind uh, if you plan to deploy any of these applications in a production application, uh, possibly with real-time capabilities for millions of users. Probably the first thing you want to think about is how much is this all going to cost? <clears throat> if you're just trying things out like a developer would, there's small amount, you know, you have small amounts of data, uh, you, a few attempts here and there, that's generally free. It's most mostly not going to cost you anything, maybe storage if you're going to keep some things there. Now, if you're new to Azure and you want to play around with these services, you can sign up using the link right here. Uh, it's top of the page, aka.ms, uh, Azure Free Credits, and you'll get $200 uh, in free credit to try you know, all the things out that I've been showing you here. So per, but for production mode, <clears throat> um, that means we might you know, have many users or our services are used frequently. Then we'll be charged by volume and rate according to the service that you're using. And there are more details on the pricing uh, here, and I've got some links for you to go in and, and take a look at some of these things because it really just kind of varies. Uh, so it might take a little bit of uh, time on your end to see if you can understand um, pricing that might gonna work specifically for your needs. You might also wanna think about whether your data is going uh, or where your, your data is going and how it's going to be used. So <clears throat> some, those are some other considerations that we, we have here. Your data, um, like images or text, it's going to be uploaded to Azure for in, inference, but it's never stored by cognitive services. This link um, gives all the details about privacy and regulation. This link here. <clears throat> but if you work in a regulated industry like medicine where data cannot leave your firewall, there is another option and that's gonna be um, containers. Oops. So some of the cognitive services that are available uh, for use as an independent container, which is really nice for those, like I said, they do need to keep the things kind of within the firewall. And you can simply download the container image, deploy it behind your firewall, and then use your local endpoints uh, that it provides just like you would if it was running in Azure. And the difference is that the data never leaves your own network. The only reason the container connects to Azure is for billing and uh, usage is charged in exactly the same way as you're using Azure yourself. So if that's a necessity, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to get started. Okay, I've saved the most important slide today for last. You've seen how easy it is to integrate powerful AI cap capabilities into your applications, but you've probably heard the, the saying, with great power comes great responsibility. And it's critically important to understand the impact of your application and what it's gonna have on people and then consider the ethical implications of that. If you're working with AI technologies, you should be working with an ethical framework that first of all focuses on enabling people to achieve more in what they already do, rather than aiming to replace humans with AI. We also wanna make sure that <clears throat> we're trying to keep that the idea that everything should be inclusive of all types of users so that everyone can benefit equally from your application. And it's done in a fair and transparent way. And particularly, it doesn't marginalize underrepresented groups. Remember, <clears throat> and remember what we learned earlier, AI is only as good as the data it was trained on. And you need to be sure that your application works for all of your potential users, regardless of who they are or what they look like. If you don't have an ethical framework set up, a great place to start is Microsoft's own principles for artificial intelligence. And you can read more about that here at the link. It's easy to add human-like capabilities with pre-built AI. Pre-built models can't do everything, but they can get you a long way pretty quickly. We'll learn about custom models for the remaining 20% in, in the rest of the learning path. AI is a powerful uh, thing, but it isn't magic. It's driven by data, and it, at its core, it's just fairly simple math. 
Always keep the data in mind and use it to help you understand what's going on. In particular, remember that even the best AI can make mistakes, especially about groups that aren't well represented in the tra training data. Finally, try it out. You don't need a lot of expertise to get started, but everyone needs to be uh, needs to needs to think about the ethical implications of AI and how it affects people. So make sure you've developed an ethical framework for using AI and you stick to it. For all the details on Azure Cognitive Services, including getting started, guides, references, check out the Microsoft Docs here. We've also got some really great um, learn modules related to AI and, and ML, so go check those out in the cog Cognitive Services specifically. <clears throat> and then you can find more resources. Here's the, the link I was mentioning at the beginning of this talk, so you can take a snapshot of that. And I encourage you to go check out the rest of the talks in this learning path. With that, I thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.